Hey fam, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Amy. You may have noticed the length of this video. <laughs> I don't know if we quite knew what we were saying when it was like, hey, do you want me to talk about rolling dough? I'll do it. And it was like, let's talk about rolling dough. Okay. And then I was like, shit. We have a lot to unpack. This is one of the first documented cases of exorcism in America. This was back in 1949. If you're not here to be here for an hour and you just want the like quick little abridged version, Pretty much everything that happened in The Exorcist was real. It was a boy and he didn't, like what Reagan did with the crucifix, yeah, that didn't happen. Nor did, did that didn't happen either, but oh, <laughs> that's still enough that did happen, right fam? <laughs> like shit. So if that's all you need, like take care, see you later, love you. Otherwise, Let's unpack. Get your coffee, get your tea. I have coffee. We're doing some caramel macchiato creamer today. Um, I don't know, like, get your bong, whatever. Like, let's unpack, dude. I don't know what I was thinking with these wigs. I said I don't need another subscription. <laughs> Normally I use the wiki for my talking points to kind of rein myself in, but I was getting frustrated. And so <sighs> I used my Discovery Plus trial thing and I totally watched that shit. And that's pretty much what I've been doing for the past week, just watching all the ghost shows. <sighs> I've barely read. I've just been like ghosting it up, dude. Anyway, so I told you I needed a responsible adult. So the talking points I'm going to use are from this episode of Shock Docs that's on the exorcism of Roland Doe. I highly recommend watching it though. Like pause this, come back later, whatever. I highly recommend it. If you're in a country where this isn't available with that uh, streaming service, you have friends and at the very least discord the episode is still an hour and 23 minutes long they go into like the context the like contextual kind of stuff like what exorcisms and this and that mean the little filler kind of things and i'm gonna try to you know keep you there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot a lot okay so we are going to talk about a young boy who grew up in Cottage City, Maryland. Most things refer to him as 13, some 14. Like, I don't know if he had a birthday, what's going on, but we're just going to say 13 for my own sanity, right? So he was an only child and outside of like school and stuff, his only real interaction with people was with adults, right? And he did have a close relationship with his aunt Tilly. The shock dog thing said Aunt Tilly, and I actually have it like Tilly in my notes. Um, and like the wiki and other articles referred to her as Aunt Harriet. This is the person who introduced Roland to the Ouija board. And it wasn't just like, what's that? Oh, it does this supposedly. Like they played with it and shit. The way they describe Roland as a kid, like his personality and stuff is like, you know, he was just your average 13 year old boy. It sounds kind of like if, if he were able to grow up in this day and age, he might be like some kind of attention deficit. Like he just, he was hyper and it wasn't that he was a bad kid in school. He was just like, he couldn't focus. You know what I mean? He would get bored very easily. A lot of us can understand that shit, right? So here we go. So around the time of January 15th, 1949, Roland and his mom begin hearing like scratches, like scratching going on on the walls, right? She assumes it's rats. So she tells her husband that night, like, can you call the exterminator and see what we can do about this, right? Exterminator, he doesn't find shit. He's like, I don't know what to tell you, lady. So it's like, okay. Well, I'm only hearing it when Roland's around. Like, is my kid trying to like, is he seeking attention or is the house haunted, right? So January 21st, unfortunately, this is when Aunt Tilly passes away. And after that, both Roland and his mom begin experiencing different things. Now, instead of just scratching, there's like banging going on on the walls, right? And they see that like a lot of things started happening like in his actual bedroom. 
How many times can I say like? So they hear what they describe as footsteps marching toward his bed. This part, dude, like this part. Allegedly him and his mother were like, oh, it's Aunt Tilly. Hey, that makes sense. I mean, that makes sense, right? Like that she would pass and she would want to come and communicate with them, right? So they're like, hey, Aunt Tilly, if it's you, knock three times. Like we just read The Demonologist by Gerald Brill, right? And if, if you don't know, when things come in like threes, and I don't mean like shitty events and stuff, I'm talking about like some folks when they talk about like getting scratches and stuff on them from spirits, or if you hear like knocking, things like that. When it comes in threes, that's supposedly a sign of demonic activity. They didn't know what they were doing, fam. They didn't, they didn't know. <laughs> I heard this part came up and I was like, oh no, <laughs> no. <sighs> so, must be Aunt Tilly, right? So now more shit starts happening. Now dishes start flying across the room. Chairs, they said like chairs were spinning. Okay. So like things would be nice and chill, just an average day that ends with Y, and then like bedtime would come and Roland would go to bed and then the bed would start shaking and everything would start up, right? Also around this time, he began having really bad nightmares and hearing this demonic voice and growling. Now, also about this time, the whole damn neighborhood is hearing everything that's going on, right, at night and they're starting to talk and they just figure like something's wrong with Roland, right? Um, his classmates, they also start talking shit. They, this is the problem I have. So on the one hand you have eyewitnesses, right? And they're like, oh yeah, things are like flying off his desk, his papers, his books, all that shit. And his teachers were like, what the fuck? It's like, I swear, I'm not doing it, I swear. But everyone treated him like he was just seeking attention. You know what I mean? And so it's like, well, pick a side. Are you vouching for him and you saw that shit? Or are you talking shit to him, you know, or about him or whatever, right? Like it just grinds my gears, okay? Anyway, so then he just, he just stops going to school. Like nobody's listening to him. Nobody believes him, fuck it, right? So this is the point when the things that they begin describing Roland as doing kept making me think of the movie, The Exorcism of Ro Emily Rose <laughs> and the things that Jennifer Carpenter was apparently capable of doing with her body. Supposedly a lot of that contortion shit, that was her, not CGI. Like, I am in awe. Like the things that people can do with their body. Anyway, awe, this is my awe face. So yeah, he's starting to go into seizures. He's, his body's contorting and stuff, right? His mother is getting very, very concerned and like, what if he has epilepsy or something? So he st she starts, she, fuck pronouns. She starts taking him to the doctor, starting to run tests and the doctor, they can't figure out anything. They're like, he seems like a perfectly healthy 13 year old boy. Maybe you should go to the psychologist. Psychologist talks with him, does some tests and stuff. They can't give any insight either so they go to their church <laughs> this part gets me every time i've tried like going over this to like tighten it up and everything <laughs> they go to a lutheran church and the lutheran minister's name is luther miles schultz <laughs> it's adorable schultz he's into parapsychology and he's hearing all this shit and he's like "Ooh, sounds like a poltergeist right so he gets this idea. We can invite Roland over. Shit still happens at the house. Poltergeist. If it comes with him, okay then. So February 17th, 1949, Roland comes over to spend the night. Now back in the day, here in America at least, couples, married couples, I've never understood this, but whatever. They would sleep in separate beds, right? So Roll or his wife goes to sleep in the guest room and Roland takes her bed. As usual, things are nice and chill, getting ready for bed, all that good shit. Soon as the lights go out, bed starts vibrating. So Schultz is like, okay, why don't we relax in these armchairs, okay? And they, you know, things settle back down. Roland might even be kind of falling back to sleep. 
boom, his freaking chair starts shaking and violent enough that it tips him right the fuck over. So finally Schultz is like, okay, let's take the mattress off the bed, put that shit on the floor, see if we can get a few hours of sleep, right? Mattress starts sliding all over the place. They even said that it like goes under the damn bed at one point. Like what? what? <laughs> Not a poltergeist. So when they get back home, it's like things ramp up again, right? Now, scratches appear on his body for four nights in a row. Lines of three. Shoal's like, okay, moving past this poltergeist idea, you should talk to a priest, like a Catholic priest, because they know more about demonology and possession and uh, exorcisms and shit, right? So, he goes to meet up with Father Albert Hughes, who reported a couple of things that happened in that meeting. For instance, Roland walks into Hughes' office temperature drops while they're talking at one point the phone like goes sliding across the desk right across the room now Roland hasn't been going to school no one's been listening to him no one's been believing him everyone's treating him as though he's just acting out right so he's like he's in it fam like he's going through it at this point he supposedly said something to father Hughes along the lines of why bother me you priest of hell the fuck? Fucking 13 year old boy. Like, what the? So. There's like this process to an exorcism, right? You don't just need permission from the archbishop and all that groovy shit. Like, the idea is like Roland's mother already checked some things. She already checked some boxes by taking him to the doctor, making sure it's nothing biological and shit like that, right? So thankfully, we already have those things taken care of. We don't have to wait anymore because now we gotta get permission. So Father Hughes contacts Archbishop Boyle, I think his name was, in Washington, DC. And he's supposedly reluctant, but he like approves the exorcism now. This portion of the story that I'm about to go over with you has a lot of disputes. They say that Father Hughes never did this, he was never affected by this for life, all those yada yadas. So like it's, it's noted in the wiki and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. But there are also eyewitnesses who claim that they were in the room when this happened and they saw this happen. So here we go. Between February 27th and March 6th of 1949, Father Hughes checks Roland into Georgetown Hospital under an assumed name. He performs the exorcism, and now, maybe you've seen videos of folks online where like people are holding them down or they get strapped down. I've always thought it was like a matter of like, you don't want them to get hurt or to hurt somebody else. You don't want them to hurt themselves. You don't want anybody else to get fucked up. So they did strap Roland down. Allegedly, during this exorcism, he got one hand free. And most articles refer to it as like a spring that he managed to like break off of this shitty ass freaking hospital bed back in the 1940s. And he like just freaking sliced the shit out of this priest, right? They said from shoulder to freaking wrist, like fucked him up. That, you know, not only did he have like muscle and nerve damage and all that stuff, but just psychologically and everything from this whole experience, right? Like he just, that changed him, allegedly. Now this would also probably fuck with Roland too, right? After everything, now this, right? So, one night after returning home, as he's getting ready for bed, he notices in like the reflection of the bathroom mirror, right? That there are scratches on his body. So him and his parents, they're thinking, oh, it spells out Louis. Cause they have family in St. Louis, right? That's where Aunt Tilly's from. So maybe this thing, whatever's going on, maybe it's telling them go to St. Louis. You can get help, resolution, something seek St. Louis. And they figure like at the very least they have family there. They can have a support system, right? Now at this point in this documentary, at least they make it a point that his parents left everything, left the job, the house, all that shit. They were at their wits end, just 
just trying to help their son. They just want their son to be okay, right? So they go to St. Louis and they stay with relatives. I can't remember which parents sibling this like household was, whose family like this was. In this quiet little suburb called Belle Noir in St. Louis on Roanoke Drive. I couldn't remember before if it was street or avenue, right? In that one video, it was drive. Good old Roanoke getting into everything. So that's a video in and of itself. So get there everything's still going on. Things could be chill during the day or not and either way at bedtime all this crazy shit's going on, right? Now here, he has a cousin there who can witness this shit, right? She's going to St. Louis University, which has like a rectory and like a church that's connected to it. And so she goes to one of her professors and discusses the situation with Roland. His name was Father Raymond Bishop. And so he agrees to come over and meet and observe Roland, right? So March 11th, Father Bishop brings Father William Bowden, a Jesuit priest. And they have Bowden's uh, great niece on this show, and she talks about how she grew up hearing all about these stories, right? About Roland Doe and everything. And she made her uncle sound like a lovely man, her great uncle sound like a lovely man, like the, what you would hope that a priest, like his demeanor, his, his soul would be like this guy sounds like he fit it perfectly, right? Very compassionate, always had a smile, was always there for people. They observe Roland for an hour. Nothing happens. All this, like, freaking shit's been going on, like, every every single night. Nothing happens. So they're like, okay, bye. Soon as they're gone, the freaking, uh, they put a bottle of holy water on his nightstand and that goes flying. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's one of the clips from that OG thing that I saw way back when because you could like see the fishing wire and everything. It was really cute. Anyway, moving on. Roland's trying to keep his cool, right? He's like, I'm not going to acknowledge it. I'm going to just go to sleep. I just got to go to sleep. Well, then his bookcase starts freaking shaking around and moving around and it actually slides and blocks his bedroom door. So re-enter the priest, Lil. <laughs> Even Father Bodern at this point is like, what the Fuck, he doesn't know shit about exorcisms, fam. He, d he doesn't know anything. So he does the Roman ritual, which is just that basic. If you've watched Supernatural, that's what they say. That's what they piss demons off. Those motherfuckers learned all that Latin and stuff. Like when you, this part, like they show you the pages from the book where it has everything. And that's everything that those guys are saying. Like, damn. But it's like your simple, basic exorcism ritual, right? done by someone who doesn't feel comfortable. He does not feel qualified for this shit. This is way past his pay grade, right fam? So, following protocol, Father Bodern puts in an official request to Archbishop Joseph Ritter, but he tells Ritter to choose another priest because he doesn't feel qualified. He's like, no, like, no, no, no. How do you think that went down? Yeah. So Father Bodon gets permission to perform the exorcism for Roland Doe. Yeah. So March 16th, we have a new timeline starting up on this day, fam. This is day one for the exorcisms. Now, during this point, they explain that in real life, when performing right, like exorcism, these can take months sometimes years to finally I don't know, take like work. I don't know, whatever. Um, so yeah, here we go. So Bodern, along with Father Raymond Bishop, the professor at Chicky Mama's College, right? And a seminary student that volunteered, he volunteered for this shit. I don't think he knew what the fuck he was getting into, fam Walter. I think that was his name. Walter, please. No, why? Anyway. <laughs> so the Archbishop is like secrecy. And Father Dern's freaked though, right? Like he's like, no. Like what he's already witnessed has him freaked. 
he wants this shit documented. So he asked Father Bishop to keep a diary during this time. At the very least, this could like, this kind of documentation could be great for priests in the future to have any idea of what to expect with an exorcism, what a uh, possessed human being is capable of and stuff like that, right? The things that work, the whole trial and error aspect of it all, right, right? So he's like, fuck that. So on this night, um, more scratches appear on Roland's body. They are bloody wounds. And according to this diary, Roland was like recoiling with each wound. And at one point the word help even appeared on his body as if branded into his flesh. Now they can see his hands, right fam? He's not doing it to himself. It like, They've been watching this little boy. This like they always described him as this like lanky little thirteen year old boy, just like he's scared shitless, right? His bed's shaking, everything's going off. Like he's terrified. He's not doing it, right? So nine hours later, nine hours later, Roland collapses and falls asleep. Okay, so this point here, this point, if I were one of these gentlemen, this would fuck with me for the rest of my life, fam, seriously. They felt as though it seemed the possession didn't really take hold of Roland until this first, like, full, completed exorcism. That's fucked, right? Like, oh, this poor kid, right? So... On day three, after two nights of exorcisms, Roland's kind of like, he's acting a bit normal, right? Could the exorcisms be working? Mm. That night is when they say it's like he transformed into a creature. He was snarling, he was biting at people. Like if you were like trying to hold him down or help him, he'd bite at you like the fuck. So while all that chaos is going on, he starts like gagging at one point, right? Just like, like he's gonna, th th sorry, this is if anyone's sensitive to this kind of shit, like, like he felt like he was gonna purge the demon or something, right? So he's like, open, you know, open the window. Like, so the wording they use for this part fam was very, it gave me a concern. <laughs> they say that when someone is going through an exorcism, they tend to get this urge quite frequently. They said quite frequently, fam. Like, oh, what? Like, it is a form of degradation. Degradation. Like, this is, like, the demon is, f like, just fouling in you up. After all that, Roland starts to fall asleep. So the Rolands are like, bye, job's done. And uh, 2 a.m. Roland says that he's starting to feel this strange sensation in his stomach. 3.15 a.m., Father Bodern receives a call. So during this time, they start to kind of, they have this theory that they start, you know, like working with, right? What if in this demonic infestation, we're dealing with multiple demons and they spat, you know, these few nights have been different demons each time and we're just dealing with the low hanging fruit. March 20th, day five. This is when the bed starts levitating. It's also around this time that, uh, cause my thoughts at this point in my life, I like to think I'm nice and logical and shit, right? I like to science things. I, it's, I mean no disrespect it's for my own sanity, absolutely, 100%. Um, it's how I handle this now, right? My question is always like, where's the scientist? Where's the physicist or whatever, right? I mean, I guess like paranormal investigators these days, they have their meters and all that stuff. So I guess they do get a bit of science. Okay, fine, it counts. A gentleman named Frank Bub Senior, was it Senior? Senior. They even like showed an article that like had his picture and stuff like that and his involvement in it. While he was there like observing and trying to 
figure out what the fuck's going on. Um, one of the things he witnessed was the nightstand levitating. He left with an opinion along the lines of, we still have a lot to discover regarding electromagnetism. <laughs> Some are Tesla's like, yup. <laughs> Oh my goodness. If you haven't watched like Ancient Aliens and stuff, there's actually an episode of a show called The Unexplained that William Shatner hosts. I watched it on Hulu. There were each episode is like a theme, like haunted objects or some like haunted places or whatever. And they touch on this subject of electromagnetism and how like a theory is that that's possibly how they built the pyramids and that one of those pyramids had like the tops missing current day but it used to have a big old fucking magnet on top of it and they even like talk about a gentleman who designed this whole this is like a garden kind of like outlook spot or whatever um and it was just him and his little contraption thing this is like tesla kind of shit right right so that's the kind of shit we're talking about here <laughs> He wasn't wrong. So March 23rd, day eight. My, la my laughter is just exasperation. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck? So at this point, Father Brodern transfers Roland to a spot at that rectory that I mentioned earlier at St. Louis University. University. It was called the St. Francis Xavier College Church. And it was on the campus of the university. So now we're back to students talking shit about Roland, right? spring like they're out and about roaming around they're seeing the lights they're like hearing the banging around and apparently some people were like there are like animal noises going on in there at this time roland also begins to show another symptom of demonic possession unnatural human strength remember this is just a 13 year old like this is just a little boy um and he's knocking people out fam he's breaking free from people breaking fucking noses at least one of those priests he busted the guy's nose march 26 day 11 unable to subdue him at the rectory father Bowden returns roland home to his family at roanoke drive for five days things seem nice and chill and everyone's like oh father Bowden's like no 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 satan fool me once you rat bastard Roland's uncle, I want to see, was like an architect or something. Like they said he had these like rolls of paper around, right? And Roland just gets this urge to start writing and shit. And so they call the priest and were like, can you decipher this? And they're like, well, if that X is like the Roman numeral 10, here begins the first set of quotes. I am not comfortable. I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's weird saying this because I like to keep things logical and stuff, but May this be the only time I feel this way <laughs> doing these ghostly story times, right, Pam? So the idea was, what if it says, I will stay 10 days, but will return after four days are up? Also written in, I am the devil himself, and I will answer in the name of spite. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, Father Bodern was like, we're not done. We are not freaking done. So April 1st is day 17, fam. Father Bodern has this idea to baptize Roland as Roman Catholic. So while his uncle and his aunt are driving him to this church, I don't, they use the word fits. Like he would go into fits a lot. I don't, I don't really like the term, that term it's, it has bad history of usage, if you know what I mean. But that's how they described him a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Um, but basically, he just, he went into a rage, fan. Like, he, like, was grabbing at the steering wheel. His uncle had, would have to pull over. Just like, because they were trying not to die, you know? They basically had to drag this kid into the church, kicking and screaming. They ended up doing this like abridged version of a baptism because he was so difficult. We're just giving these priests the benefit of the doubt, fam. We're giving them the benefit of the doubt. We're trying. So three days after this, Father Bodern's like, you know, he's really, 
Roman's like, he, Roman, damn it. That's my friend's black lab. <laughs> Roland, he's not doing okay. Like it's really like taking a toll on his body. And he, so like Father Bodron's like, maybe we should take him back to home turf. Maybe we should go back to Maryland and find somewhere that can give him proper care while we continue doing what we need to do, right? No one wants to take him. No one. They want nothing to do with it. And it sounds like he moved them back to frickin' Maryland, Cottage City, their house that they frickin' ditched. And no one would help him, so they went back like, damn, this family, damn. April 10th, day 26, we are almost out a month of this shit, fam. Roland is admitted to the psychiatric ward at Alexi and Brothers Hospital. Now this is run by an ancient order of Catholic monks known for taking difficult cases of mental illness. Now is when I start struggling to really give these priests and I don't have a very, like, I don't trust. I just don't trust. And so the whole like they were known for taking difficult cases of mental illness and this is 1949 like just psych 101 just that one single class you don't even have to go for the degree just that one class will take you over the history of psychology and the things that doctors were doing to people back in these days we know like the, the, there's the penthurst penthurst asylum and shit like that there's like <sighs> But this is Roland's story. So now the Catholic Church can have their secrecy too, can't they, fam? A lot of this stuff that we know about is from priests that were involved and monks from this hospital that broke their vows of silence at the end of their lives. There was actually a monk that was interviewed for this special or for this episode. Um, there's an author, Taylor, no, Troy Taylor. He wrote The Devil Comes. The Devil Came to St. Louis. And he interviewed one of these monks that was at this hospital that witnessed things that happened with Roland. And that is, it. like, seriously, here's your reminder. If you're still with me and you're still intrigued, you need to watch this freaking shit. So he says that one of the things he witnesses was the boy's body levitating. My next note in this, I don't want to say that I'm quoting this monk for this one, but it was definitely mentioned around this time. So I can't remember exactly who said it. So just in all fairness, it may have been him. It may have been somebody else. But one of the things mentioned was like, how do you reconcile like holding this boy's feet down as he's like convulsing and stuff as the bed levitates. Like, how do you, <laughs> so April 13th, day 29, I think his name was Walter. It was Walter, right? That you just didn't know what he was getting himself into fam. When he volunteered for this shit, he just didn't know. He thinks that Roland could use some fresh air, right? So he takes Roland to the White House Retreat Center. And one of the things that they have on this land is this like path through this like garden or something. Now what Roland doesn't know, I don't think Roland had been there before, but Walter had. And this is gonna sound really familiar for Conjuring fans. Even if you've watched a trailer what Roland doesn't know, but Walter does, is just beyond the woods or whatever the heck from this path is a cliff, right? So while they're going along this path of, it's, they have what they call the Stations of the Cross, which are just different points in the crucifixion, right? So going along this path, like Roland's intrigued by these different parts, but when they get to the um, station, uh, that was the part of Jesus being placed in the tomb. Roland snaps. He goes into one of his rages and ends up like just looking at it. Just takes the fuck off. Walter's like, fuck! Chases him down because he knows about the cliff, right? 
So he ends up having to like tackle Roland. Roland has no memory of this afterwards. No fucking memory whatsoever. Now, at this point, Roland is skin and bones. Everyone's fucked up. Father Bodern lost 40 pounds this single month alone. He had boils on his body, pus and things were happening, man. Like, everyone, all these people have just, every night doing these exorcisms, they are all fucked. And the whole time, Father Bodern is just, we gotta save this boy. We gotta help him. He refused to give up on Roland. He knew that this was a demonic possession, demonic infestation, and he couldn't give up on him. A few days later, April 16th, we've officially passed any month point. It is day 32, day before Easter that year. One of the monks places a figurine of St. Michael in Roland's room. And for those who don't know the Christian Catholic lore, St. Michael is the archangel who performed the actual act of casting Lucifer and the other fallen angels into hell. So April 18th, day 34. And their attempts to figure out anything that could help, anything that could affect. At this point, they have all these different like I, I keep thinking of the mummy and that one dude who's just like, I like just trying the different things. They have all these different saints and different jewelry on Roland, right? He starts complaining that it's burning his skin. Like, can you please get this off of me? Like, it's hurting me. Father Bodern's like, fuck you, Satan, forces a crucifix into Roland's hand. There's the crucifix, fam. Roland goes into the worst convulsions of all. He's, they say his body erupts at this point. Now, in this state, Roland says he had a prophetic vision. He saw like that he was outside of a cave with this angel with a flaming sword. And this angel was like shoving and just kicking these demons right back into hell. And St. Michael turned to Roland and he smiled and said the one word. Now, I apparently wanted to skip this part. I didn't want to do it, okay? I didn't want to do it. So from the diary, Roland was in a seizure, but lay calm. In clear, commanding tones and with dignity, a voice broke into prayers. So supposedly, when, you know, Father Bodern puts the cross, the crucifix into Roland's hands, what was happening on that side of things, while well, Roland's elsewhere, he was saying in a deep, like, like demonic voice, he has to say one word, one little word. I mean, one big word. He'll never say it. I am always in him. I may not have much power always, but I am in him. He will never say that word. Now in Roland's vision that he was having of St. Michael, when St. Michael turned to him and looked at him and smiled, he said, Dominus, which in Latin means Lord. And apparently that part came through Roland. And it said that he relaxed. He completely relaxed. And from then on, it was completely normal. And he was like, he's gone. Father Bodern's like, fuck you, Satan. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Fool me once, you rat bastard. And he prays, like, please show us a sign. Is this it? Are we okay? Is Roland safe? Or do we need to remain vigilant? And they reported that there was this boom that like shook the whole freaking place. And this hospital is huge, right? One of the monks later reported that he thought the furnace blew. And over at the nearby church, that rectory with the college campus and all that shit, a priest there reported seeing the figure of St. Michael. So Father Broder hears all this shit and he's like, 
job's done. Job's done, fam. I shit you not. Roland went home to Maryland a couple weeks later. Went back to school. He got a doggy. This kid, this kid grew up, became an actual rocket scientist, fam. He did shit. You can look it up. There's things. Like, what the fuck? Had a family. He even named his kid Michael. Never went public. Never, ever went public. Um, there are articles which actually name him and a family name. Um, and when I came out, I was mad when I, you know me and people's pride. I don't like it when people do that shit. <laughs> like what the fuck? It turns out he passed away in 2020. Nothing that I've come across anyway is reporting any of the 2020 fuckery that we've been dealing with. But he was like 13 in 1949. It sounds like he lived his life. He had a good long life, fam. Okay. So the reason that we know all of this stuff that we know, one of the reasons anyway, is in 1978, they were gonna like tear down one of these buildings. I think it was one of the buildings at the Alexian Brothers Hospital, but it might be like that college dorm it thing. It was like some back locked room that they found before tearing this place down. And in that room, there was a desk. And in that desk was a copy of this freaking diary that Father Bishop was keeping during this time. And that's when a lot of shit hit the public. Now, yeah, I mean, like in 1950, William Peter Blatty heard about this when he was going to Georgetown University. He heard about this case. But, like, most details, like, it took decades for that shit to come out. You had Father Bodern talking about it. Like, his great niece vouches that she grew up hearing these stories. Um, but it really wasn't until, like, that diary, that copy of the diary was found. Now... We're still not done, fam, because now we have a question. Now, there was an investigator that was one of the people that is giving us, you know, information and eyewitness accounts and going over things with us throughout this whole doc, right? He tells a story because the question is, what if they really didn't exercise that demon? What if... It did not get cast back down to hell. What if someone sacrificed himself for Roland? So he, uh, he says that he was invited to go to this building that's near, nearby, like connected, but not um, that like, there was like no personnel while he was walking through this building. Fucking ghost town, right? And he got to a door eventually where he went to like reach for it and the guy that was with him was like we don't open that door put your ear up to it and listen and he said that he you could hear like things slamming into the wall slamming into the door there was shit going on in that room the, ugh, this it's so sad okay so what if one of the monks the priest gentlemen that were there what if he took that demon into himself? And they whisked this gentleman off to this secluded spot. And that's where that gentleman spent the rest of his life. Now that he's passed, shit's still in there, fam. Locked away, hopefully for safe keeping. <laughs> I hate that. I don't like it at all, fam. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Why? So, yeah. That's the exorcism of Roland Doe, fam. One of the original documented cases of exorcism in America. Fucking like a 13 year old boy. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, I still recommend that you check out that doc. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And I already know what we're going to talk about next time. <laughs> so until then, you take care. Please be safe. I will try as well. I will also try to not lose track of time anymore watching these shows. I started watching one called Haunted Hospitals. So I'll see you next week. <laughs>